इनके मेल में आया होगा रिसेंट कर प्रिया डॉट गोलाश नाम है तो फिर हम ओपन कर देते हैं वहां से ले लेंगे आस्क टू ज्वाइन दिस पे a very good afternoon uh, to everybody and today we're going to discuss about a very very interesting case scenario uh, which is uh, in the form of ovarian cyst causing precocious puberty now we all know that precocious puberty uh, is a very common presentation in girls but most of these girls who have this precocious puberty actually have a peripheral so most of the girls who have uh, precocious puberty actually have a central form of precocious puberty but today we won't discuss about four specific cases who actually had a peripheral form of precocious puberty in which essentially we found a specific pathology because of a large ovarian cyst which was responsible and what we'll do in this perspective is try to discuss about various scenarios in which different forms of this peripheral precocious puberty presents how is it different what sort of evaluation is required and how do we manage about this in that regards so i am joined by uh, dr priyanka who will be joining our team and uh, she is currently undergoing fellowship under the medi classes uh, hybrid fellowship program and uh, she will be discussing about uh, a very specific case of uh, precocious puberty who presented with a uh, multiple recurrent ovarian cysts so ovarian cysts is a common presentation so we will carry forward first of all initially we will have a brief overview about the various aspects and then we will carry forward from that regards as to how do we go forward from evaluation assessment and management in that uh, perspective so why is it that we need to worry about uh, ovarian cysts because ovarian cyst is something which can happen as part of any changes in a normal scenario and often these follicular cysts are there and they are reported as functional ovarian cyst but in a young girl who is presenting to us we need to be wary about multiple factors so i'll highlight this with this case this was a 3 year old girl who presented with vaginal bleeding 
she had thylarchy within two weeks, stage two breast development and pubic hair, and she was not very tall in that regard. So this is a very, very unusual scenario. Normally, we talk about how there is a gap of approximately one year between the onset of thylarchy to the progression as far as the vaginal bleeding is concerned. Now, in this scenario, what we are seeing is that there is just some breast development which has happened in the last two weeks. And since then, you have a vaginal bleeding which suggests that this is an extremely hyper-estrogenic state. So, estrogen becomes too high, the breasts don't get time to progress and you have got vaginal bleeding. Now, vaginal bleeding typically happens when there is a withdrawal. So, usually it means that the cyst now is not forming a very high level of estrogen. So, your estrogen levels are coming down and now the bleeding happens. So, this is what was assumed in this case. There were no features of cafe all spots or rickets and the parameters which showed that the LH and FSH was undetectable and estrogen levels were reasonably high at that point of time. Now, what I'm trying to say is that this is the phase when your estrogen is weaning off. So, probably this is the time when this 43 estrogen, which is very high for this girl, the levels would have been even higher going up above 100 also in many scenarios of peripheral precocious puberty. So this was a classical case and it was found to have an ovarian cyst which was detected. Now, the big question here is what to do from here. So most of us thought that, okay, there is no other clinical features of hypothyroidism, no features of McEwen Albright syndrome. So let's reassure this girl and just follow up on that perspective. But what happened that she presented a couple of years later with a trivial fall resulting in fracture which was attributed to a fibrous dysplasia, which was developed. Now, there are no other clinical manifestations of McEwen Albright at that point of time, yet she actually behaved like McEwen Albright in that perspective. So this really highlights that even if you have an isolated ovarian cyst, if it's happening at a very early age, you have to think of a genetic cause. And I always say if you have a severe syndromic soon or segregating etiology, these are the four conditions where genetic causes have to be considered. And McEwen Albright is essentially a somatic disorder. And when you talk about a somatic disorder, the manifestations will depend upon how many cells are affected. So you may or may not have the entire spectrum, which is there in that perspective. So what we'll try to do over the next hour or so is try to cover four of very interesting cases and how they differ and make uh, appears similar also in various perspective to go from there. All of you can go and have a look at our website, learning.growsociety.in, which has got a lot of uh, resources regarding pediatric endocrinology, including courses, online courses for fellowship and diploma programs. We do run a number of uh, monthly programs like uh, our lecture series for postgraduates, for grand rounds. And these programs try to cover the entirety of pediatric endocrinology over a two to three year period from that regard. A mobile application helps guide, evaluate, assess, and manage conditions along with our publications, both basic and advanced pediatric endocrinology. And just recently, we last month, we brought out this pediatric endocrinology protocols, which covers the various aspects of evaluation and management. Now, what we're going to do over the next hour or so is try to cover four cases. So we've got an infant with ovarian cyst, which initially Nani will talk about. Then we have cyst with cystic lesions, uh, skin lesions, young girl with ovarian cyst, and finally a girl with short stature and ovarian cyst. Before we do that, we will have a look with regards to a basic understanding of what we are talking about before we go ahead deep in terms of individual cases. So when we talk about puberty, we know that there are three major organs which regulate the pubertal onset, the hypothalamus, which produces the GnRH, the pituitary, which produces the gonadotrophins, and the ovary, which produces the estradiol. Now, within that, we typically classify this into a central form of precocious puberty, where you have got a high level of gonadotrophins. It's more of a concordant development. Typical gap between thylarchy and vaginal bleeding is around one and a half to two years. If it's less than one year, we start thinking that it doesn't look like a central precocity. And then mostly it's idiopathic. While peripheral precocious puberty is more like a ovarian estrogen production, characterized by hypogonotropic scenario, low LHFSH discordant pattern. Like in the first case, you had got a breast development and suddenly you have got the vaginal bleeding. So if you have a history that, okay, last one year there was breast development and now bleeding happens, this looks more like a central precocious puberty. If you have no breast development, 
and you have a bleeding, this looks like a local cause. But if you have some breast development and yet you have got bleeding, this discordant pattern suggests a peripheral precocious puberty, which is usually more likely to be pathological. Now, there are various causes which can cause the central precocious puberty, which will include effects like tumor, radiation, trauma, and any insult will cause that. But most of it is 95% will be idiopathic. So beyond six years, we do not want to do unnecessary evaluation in the form of an MRI to identify a lesion. There are rare genetic causes which may also be there in that regard. Now, what our focus is most towards this aspect of the algorithm. So we'll talk about largely about McEwen Albright syndrome as a possibility. Hypothyroidism, we all know. The TSH, when the levels are very high, is going to act on that the FSH receptor to cause this development. Rarely you can have an estrogenic adrenal tumor, which can cause that. So within the scheme of causes of precautious puberty, we will be focusing about the peripheral precautious puberty, which will include ovarian and will focus pretty much all these three as a group. And then you can have rare scenarios like aromatase, excess, or exogenous or Pugh Jagger syndrome as a form. So functional ovarian cyst is uh, uh, a very common finding, which is basically means that your dominant follicle has become bigger and it's producing estrogen and it's usually LH independent. Now the course is usually fluctuating and often it's a one-off phenomena. I'll talk about that as to if you have a single isolated cyst, whether you need to worry about genetic causes or not, that's an important issue. But mostly it's a single event. It will not happen repeatedly if it's just a functional cyst. And you will have a high uh, estradiol levels which will be there in that regard. So management largely is observation. And we'll talk about criteria when you need to worry about and when you can think of torsion or malignancy as a possibility. So a cyst which is less than 10 centimeters typically who doesn't have a solid cystic area does not require a surgical intervention. You can manage it conservatively. Granulosa cell tumor is exceedingly rare, but it is known to occur in children. So it's basically will have a very rapid production. Your estradiol levels will be sky high. So if you talk about a cyst, so what happened? There was a cyst, there's some bleeding, some breast development, and then regresses. Here it will be a continued process. It will continue to grow from that perspective. Your estradiol levels will be very, very high, and you will have other markers which will be produced. So if you have a granulosa cell, it's going to produce more of inhibin, AMH, all other factors will come from there. And you may also have tumor markers which are being produced. So this is more like a ovarian estrogenic tumor. Very rare, but if you have very rapid estrogenization, which is persisting and you have a large cyst, which has a solid cystic area, start worrying about this condition really. Management, of course, is cumbersome. You will require gynecological referral, surgical intervention, and further management will come from there. Now, one important condition which we'll be discussing today is the McEwen Albright syndrome, which is basically a problem in the GNAS1 region. So the GNAS is an important part as far as the cyclic AMP pathway. As far as the reproductive phenotype is concerned, this is because of overexpression or overfunction of the LH and FSH receptor, which basically will act on the ovaries to produce breast development, which will happen early, and you will have this discordant menarchal level. Again, the estrogen levels will become very, very high. Importantly, because you do not have much effect as far as the adrenal axis, you will not have pubarchy. They will present purely with a vaginal bleeding and some breast development. Because of very high FSH receptor expression, you will have large ovarian cyst. And the typical pattern is that, okay, you have got development now, you have got bleeding, you see a ovarian cyst, then the ovarian cyst regresses. There is a period in which there is no significant development and then the second cyst appears. So it's like in the somatic areas where you have a problem in the ovaries. Now this is a somatic defect. So not the entire ovary is affected. So it's not behaving like a testotoxicosis. Now if you talk about testotoxicosis, that is a LHCG receptor activating mutation. So the entire testis is producing a huge amount of testosterone. This is not working like a ovotoxicosis. This is like certain cells in the ovaries, certain of these oocytes or the, uh, the follicular cells will be starting to become more active. And so time and again, some of them will be selected and they will start producing. So it's a off and on 
waxing and waning phenomena which is common in the setting of McEnald Bright syndrome. Now, TSH, of course, there are many other receptor, many other hormones which act through the GNAS pathway. So in TSH, it will cause thyrotoxicosis. You will have growth hormone excess causing acromegaly in certain scenarios. You may have an ACTH independent Cushing syndrome scenario. Skin lesions, of course, which are very, very important are again because of the melanocyte stimulating hormones. So MSH hyperactivity in certain regions will cause pigmentation. And you will have bone abnormalities in the form of hypophosphatemic rickets like scenario. Or you may also have a scenario of fibrous dysplasia. So the classic description of McEwen Albert syndrome, which is imprinted in most of our minds, is a combination of peripheral precocious puberty along with cafe oil spots and fibrous dysplasia. Now, what you need to remember is that this is a textbook description. And in real life, the patient has not read the textbook. So they will not come to you with these three complaints that I have got McEwen Albert because I have got ovarian cyst, I have got a cafe oil spot, and I've got fibrous dysplasia. They can come with multiple varying manifestations. They may just come to you with isolated fibrous dysplasia, which is a very, very common, most common presentation, I will say. So you will have bony lesions, some bony swelling, especially in the skull areas, in the hand. There may be a trivial fracture. So you have to keep your eyes and ears open that, okay, this could be a fibrous dysplasia. Think of McEwen Albert in that regards. They may present to you just with recurrent ovarian cyst where there is no other manifestations which are present that you have to be worried about. Similarly, in scenarios like macronodular adrenal uh, ACTH independent macronodular disease, you have to think of a possibility of McEwen Albright. Any child who has got growth hormone excess, McEwen Albright is a strong possibility. Any child with hypophosphatemic rickets, think of McEwen Albright. So you don't need to have the entire combination. Even a single manifestation becomes important. I'll talk a bit about criteria about McEwen Albright a bit later subsequently. So this is a somatic defect, variable and fluctuating course. And you may also have a secondary central precocity. Now, remember, it's a defect which is there in the GNAS pathway. So what's basically happening is that your pathway continues to be active because the GTPAs action is compromised. So all the whole process of cyclic MP is continuously being produced in that regards. Now, this defect may not be present in the whole blood because it's a somatic one. So often most of the tests are not able to detect this and this becomes important from that regards. A word about hypothyroidism, so uncontrolled hypothyroidism will cause a very high level of TSH, which will act on the FSH receptor to cause large ovarian cyst because there is a structural homology between the TSH, FSH, LH, HCG, and we have discussed this in many details. And this will cause large ovarian cyst. They may go up to 8 centimeters, 10 centimeters. I've seen cases who have been referred for uh, surgical management, but then they are found to have hypothyroidism in that regards. They will have breast development. They will, of course, have vaginal bleeding, but they will have a delayed bonage because of the hypothyroidism primarily and very importantly because of hyperprolactinemia, they will have a low level of LH. So high apparent FSH activity, which is going to cause more ovarian stimulation, and low level of LH will basically mean that you have got no amount of pubarchy. So again, if you compare this scenario to a boy who presents to you with a severe uncontrolled hypothyroidism, they will again have the same scenario, large testis and no pubic hair. Similarly, large ovaries and no pubic hair. So effectively, one y Grumbach syndrome, as the term is called, is similar in manifestation in both boys and girls. It's just a matter of how they present. Depending upon menarche, you will get it much more easier. In girls, in boys, as I said, FSH is a minor player. So high FSH will do nothing. It is not going to cause any change. It will only cause increased Sertoli cells, causing more testicular size from that regards. Again, no pubarchy is there. Rare scenario, which is similar to manifestations as far as McEwen Albert is concerned, is Fuse Chega syndrome. It's a problem, it's considered to be a neoplastic disorder, part of endocrine neoplasia syndrome. So it's the STK11. Again, this is going to cause more cellular growth. So all of these are causing more cellular growth. Manifestations are ovarian sex steroid tumors, 
which may again cause precocious puberty, which will be peripheral in the form. And very importantly, you will have pigmented lesions which are there in the mouth like lentigens. I'll showcase one of my papers which I'd done in Australia, which showed that MAS may also have these form of lentigens and they may also cause gastric polyps. So there is an overlap between STK11 and GNAS1. So these are like all the growth pathways which are going to be stimulated. Subsequently, we'll discuss about that. Aromatase excess, extremely rare scenario. Again, it will cause precocious puberty. You will have high levels of estrogen and you will have increased growth and bone age in that regards. Now, when should you think of a peripheral precocious puberty? So basically, if you have a very simple traffic as it's going like this, it's a concordant pattern, it's more likely to be a central precocious puberty. But if you're traveling somewhere in Kanpur or something where you find such a bizarre sort of a traffic and everybody is going here and there, you think of it's more like a peripheral, it's like an organized chaos. That's what peripheral precocious puberty is. So it's a fast and discordant pattern of peripheral precocious puberty. Of course, the most important tests are gonadotrophins, and we all talk about the importance of LH, which is much more important compared to FSH. Invariably, if you think of central precocious puberty, your LH FSH will be zero. Anybody who has a high FT4 should have a zero TSH. Anybody whose cortisol is high should have an ACTH which is undetectable. Similarly, if you have very high estrogen, you expect your basal LH to be less than 0.1. So generally, you are not in much doubt. But you can do a GNR stimulation test if there is a confusion. You give a triptoralin or you give luprolide 20 microgram per kg, 100 micrograms. And then you check your LH levels after 0, 2, and 4 hours, and you will find that there is lack of response, which will suggest that this is a peripheral precautious puberty. But for me, a very high estrogen level and an undetectable LH is pretty good enough. You then have to go for imaging in that regard. So, what you do is that if you have complete development and your LH is prepubertal, you have to go for peripheral precocity and go for imaging in that. Regards. So now we'll start off with the case scenario and I'll invite uh, Dr. Dhwani to come up uh, on the uh, scenario and start off with this presentation. We'll see if there are any, I think there's one question which was there. So we'll start off with uh, Dr. Dhwani to start with this discussion. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the first case is much similar to the case already described by sir. We had a two-year, six-month-old girl who presented to us with fresh bleeding per vaginum for one day. Uh, History-wise, the mother told us that she had noticed chest development for the last 10 days. However, they had not noticed any hair growth in the axilla or pubic area. And she gave no history of a rapid height gain notice in the child in the recent past. So just by the history of it, it looks like a peripheral uh, precocious puberty that has happened in this girl and the most common causes that one would consider in a two-year six-month-old girl would be trauma, vulvovaginitis and ovarian cyst. So we went on to uh, take the history further and uh, we were told that the child comes from a joint family is always under supervision. So the history of uh, the likelihood of a trauma or an abuse becomes less likely. Would you think of uh, trauma or a sexual abuse in this scenario? Not really, sir. But especially with the chest development, it is. So I think that's a very, very important yeah. giveaway that you have got some breast development which happened. And subsequent to that, you had a bleeding. So it's yeah. not that it's absolutely absent. So yeah. those becomes less likely. So yes, you talked about ovarian cyst as a possibility. Yeah. What would be a close differential to this scenario? When you have some breast development and you have got bleeding. So ovarian cyst. Now, ovarian cyst, I mean macular bed, hypothyroidism, functional, everything comes into one group. Now, what would be the other cause which can cause similar symptoms? Um. And exogenous estrogen exposure must be. Yes, I think that is something which is extremely important as we see very commonly in the setting of the labial adhesions when people will be applying these estrogen and then you will have some immediate breast development mm -hmm. and bleeding which may happen. There was no history of local itching or redness noticed by the parents. She had no history of lethargy, constipation or any other feature suggestive of hypothyroidism. There were no large birthmarks noticed by the parents and there was no history of fractures. Um, because the history was unreliable, we also uh, tried to look for the central causes. 
parents give no history of headache or laughter spells in the child? That's a very important point. You mentioned that you're thinking of a central possibility. So, is it possible, like we have said that you have got a gap between Pilarki and Minarki of around one year, typically. Can you have a closer gap than that in central precocious puberty? In rapidly progressive uh, cranial uh, lesions, we may have... Uh, so, very importantly, if you have something like a hypothalamic hematoma, which is large, you will have such a high level of estrogen. So, again, you will get more than this, you may go up to B3. But I've seen B2, B3, and then you have got period. Still, you have got a possibility of a central precaution puberty. So just because your gap is less than one year, especially in a young age, does not effectively exclude. Now, can you have ovarian cysts? Suppose you say, okay, I've done ultrasound which is ovarian cysts in this scenario. <clears throat> does that exclude central precaution puberty? <laughs> no, no, in this case. Two years, six months old girl, you find the ovarian cyst, you have not looked into energetic age. Does the presence of ovarian cyst exclude central precautions? No. I think then why do you have already explain ovarian cyst? Because the input which was the initial terror to take of the increase in the energy, it could increase the FSH is the initial and increase the initial estrogen. Okay. How, what do you explain? Yes, the central one, uh, if if it is so a central one. Ultimately, ovarian cysts can happen because of the coronary drop yes. stimulation also. Mm -hmm. So, what I'm trying to say is that just because you find an ovarian cyst in ultrasound, that does not exclude a central cause. Because <laughs> as you see, so many uh, uh, girls later on will have functional ovarian cysts, this is all because of coronary drop in uh, dependent form. Mm -hmm. So, that is important. Uh, moving on to the examination, her weight and height were essentially at the 50th centile for age. Uh, her SMR showed a B2 to B3 staging with uh, P, uh, pubic hair stage 1 and uh, fresh bleeding for vaginum was seen. There was no thyromegaly. These are the two tiny cafe oil spots that we could visualize. The one on the abdomen was really faint, but again, it was in the midline and the other lesion was on the right arm. So, what is the pattern of uh, cafe oil spots? What number will be significant? What size will be significant? Uh, usually, the cafe oil spots seen in Macchion Albright syndrome are associated with the midline. Uh, lesions more than five uh, are uh, significant. Size may vary. Uh, you, although uh, classically larger size macules are seen in Macchion Albright syndrome, however, it is a spectrum, and one smaller lesions have also been described in Macchion Albright. So this is not leading us to anywhere, but it may suggest that there may be some macular bed as a possibility. But this is not strongly favoring that. Usually you will have much larger cafe oil spots. They will have a very irregular margin. So margin is a bit irregular, which you can see on the left one. But generally they will be much larger from that perspective. So theoretically, macular bed is possibility that becomes less at the moment. Yeah. Uh, on per vaginal examination, and the mucosa was pale and no signs of trauma or foreign body was. So there was a brachymetatarsia. Can you link it up? Um, it was familial. It, it was seen also so in the how common is brachymetatarsia and how common is it without pseudo hypoparathyroidism or Turner syndrome? Generally, vacuumatic arsenal is linked with the soft uh, defect and that is not linked with the macular albine. But yes, many yeah. normal individuals also, if you see carefully, will have vacuumatic arsenal. So, if you talk about it being a sensitive marker of pseudo hypoparathyroidism or Turner syndrome, it will be, but it will not be a specific marker. In that, many normal girls will also have those manifestations. So, this is not fitting into, but yes, you are able to pick it up. That's important from that regard. So it won't change that management much. So what we are looking at is that there is only breast 2 to breast 3 and you have got vaginal bleeding. So it's a very, very significant disorder which we are seeing here. Carry forward. Um, examination revealed an LH FSH of 0.3 and estrogen level that was not very high. So maybe this was in the falling, uh, the level was done so when it's a very, very important pattern again. That bleeding had happened how many days before? When they came to us, it had happened for three days already. And it had stopped by the time. They no, came. she was still. So, generally, when you talk about estrogen bleeding, 
the bleeding may happen if your estrogen level is continuously high and your endometrial thickness becomes too huge and then you will have that uh, the peripheral areas will shed but the other way is that when your estrogen levels are really false it's not sustaining the endometrial treatment degree so this could be a withdrawal bleeding which we are looking at uh, her thyroid profile was in the normal range. Calcium and phosphorus were also again in the normal range, making macronaldehyde less likely, considering that there was no thyrotoxicosis or uh, hypophosphatemia. Ultrasound of the pelvis showed a uterus that was in the pubertal range at 3.5 by 1.4 by 1.6 centimeters. There was a large left ovarian cyst, which was hypoechoic and 2.4 by 2.3 centimeters. The right ovary was normal in size and there was an endometrial thickness of 8 millimeters seen in the child. So, uh, so suppose you have got uh, a scenario in which you are, you are expecting active cysts like this. What are the expected estrogen level? Usually more than 40, more than 100 actually. It is, so if the levels of estrogen are more than 100, it's not central, it's usually peripheral. Right. So what is clearly shown is that there is an estrogen effect, there is some breast development, there is a pale mucosa as you were mentioning, there is ET thickness of 8 mm, which is very, very significant. And uh, in fact, the uterus is also seemingly quite big for this particular age. So there was this cyst which was there, which was producing estrogen. But now probably it's coming down and that's why all the levels are not very high. And NH is 0.31. What do you, how do you interpret that NH at this age? Two years, four months. For just two years, we take the uh, cutoff of point. So it's central then. So what do you? How do you explain this point? How do we explain? Okay, so in the estrogen withdrawal stage, there may be some increase so in the LH. If you are estrogen was very high, yes. you may be suppressing yes. the LH to a zero level, and when it comes in now, it's like a research. It's yes. like you have got this uh, sick euthyroid syndrome that in the initial phase, your TSH is low. When you are recovering, your TSH is going high. So I would not really bother about this. If you talk about, uh, let's say, anybody who has got hypothalamic hematoma or some organic cause of centrifugal cause of puberty, the NH levels in that case will be six, seven, hugely high. It can't be this level of NH. So again, if you just interpret this, this is just a rebound phenomena. So I wouldn't be too bothered about that. You know. We had also planned uh, GNRX stimulation in this case, but it was somehow not. Done. It was probably not required. Yeah. Moving on, the skeletal survey done from uh, done to look for fibrous dysplasia was normal, and uh, yeah. So essentially, now you have got a scenario which looks like a functional ovarian cyst in that regards. Uh, so, what is the likelihood of this girl having macular, right? Now, that's a major question that is to be there. You have excluded hypothyroidism. What is the likelihood of this girl having macular, right? And a estrogenic ovarian tumor. Uh, for an estrogenic ovarian tumor, the ultrasound finding should have shown a solid cystic lesion, a purely uh, hypoechoic cyst makes the possibility of a, G, a granulosa cell tumor less likely. Mm -hmm. She could still be an evolving macronalbrite because um, I'm not sure of the exact percentage, but a good percentage of macronalbrite presented with ovarian cyst and then went on to develop other features of... Um, How common is ovarian cyst at this age? Um, so ovarian cyst, contrary to popular belief, can happen even antenatal. Yes. People have seen many girls who develop antenatal ovarian cyst and they're very common because ultrasounds are not done routinely. Mm -hmm. You and many girls who come to you with isolated breast development, some development or something may have had this sort of a thing. Their estrogen was not high enough. So this is not very uncommon. So I talk about one study in which they really looked at in terms of isolated ovarian cyst and genetic causes. Yes. So if you have a single cyst with no extra ovarian manifestations, we are justified in observing and not doing undue work. But the only thing is that this is a young girl, so we need to be more cautious. The chance of macular aldehyde will be much higher. When we talk about the older girl, they are the chances will be even less likely in that age. Yeah, you know. uh, so functional ovarian cysts, the incidence of ovarian cysts in general is 2 to 5 percent in pre-pubertal girls. And among the among these autonomous so ovarian cysts. 5 percent is huge. Yeah. 
which means that uh, so many girls will be roaming around with ovarian system. And among these two to five percent, about approximately five percent have autonomic functioning ovarian cysts. Uh, usually, a diameter of more than nine millimeters is suggestive of an autonomic function. And although the cutoff is of more than nine millimeters, usually these cysts have a size of two point five to five point five centimeters. They are usually isolated. They develop and regress spontaneously. And often, bone age is not advanced with functional ovarian cysts, even uh, those that are. Um, Recurring again. The common differential diagnosis that we've already discussed with Randlosa cell tumor, macronalgite, and hypothyroidism must be looked for uh, in these patients. Uh, management wise, as sir has already mentioned, these are often self limiting and a conservative approach is uh, beneficial. However, 40% may have a chance of recurrence. And with uh, if these cysts keep on recurring because of uh, intermittent rapid uh, high dose of estrogen exposure, there may be a central uh, trigger of precocious puberty. And in such cases, uh, cytotron acetate, uh, third generation aromatase inhibitors like anastrozole, letrozole have been tried. Even estrogen receptor agonist tamoxifen have been, has been used. GNRH agonist can be used for a centrally central triggered uh, precocity, but one must remember that it will not prevent recurrence of an ovarian cyst in these scenarios. Surgery is indicated only with a very large size, as sir has already mentioned, where risk of torsion is very high. Um, where there is development, rapid development of secondary sexual characteristics and persistence of cysts for more than three months. So, um, Although there are multiple uh, studies uh, that have shown a case series of uh, isolated functional ovarian cysts, the pattern is much similar as the current study that I'm showing here. Uh, so if we look at it, yes. In this series of 11 patients, three had an onset at uh, ovarian cysts diagnosed even in the prenatal period, and the rest of them had uh, around two to five years, two to nine years of age uh, occurrence of ovarian cysts. Recurrence was seen in almost four of these patients, so about 40% as we've already seen out of 11, about four had recurrence uh, in later stages of time. In the uh, index child, she bled for about five days with intermittent spotting. Follow-up at two weeks showed a regression in breast stage uh, and soft breast suggesting that the estrogen exposure had waned off and we plan to closely follow her up to look for recurrence. Thank you. Yeah, so I think this was an interesting case. Uh, thanks, Sunny, for this uh, case scenario as well and how it changes over time is a pattern and we need to follow up also becomes very, very important. So we will take questions uh, which are there. So uh, yes, sir, so Dr. Raghupati has pointed out the typo in the height so that girl was actually 94 centimeters. We apologize for that. Dr. Elizabeth is asking about estrogen levels in functional ovarian cysts are high enough to cause breast development and then beating, but do not accelerate the bone age. Dr. Elizabeth, this is related to the fact that the duration is also important. So it's not just how much your levels are, how long these levels are. So usually these cysts will regress in certain times. Uh, so it does not cause acceleration bone age, but if it's persistent like macunal, right, you will have a scenario in which it will increase. Dr. Bharani is asking what proportion of increase in bone age in exogenous estrogen versus macunal, right? Because I've seen a girl with estrogen with raised bone age. Yes. So if you give exogenous uh, estrogen at a very high level, of course, you will have a scenario in which you will have a very rapid development, which will happen from that uh, perspective. And then bone age can really accelerate. So I think we'll carry forward from there. So we will now ask request Dr. Priyanka, you are there. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, Dr. Priyanka, so it's uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Priyanka, who is uh, currently working as a pediatrician at Monilek Hospital in Jaipur, and she has been very enthusiastic uh, participant in our medical classes sessions. And she'll be presenting a case which we jo managed uh, jointly. Uh, a very interesting young girl. So, please, uh, you can share the presentation from your side. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to present this case of petrol precocious puberty in a girl with ovarian cysts. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, this was a girl 
the history of presenting illness was she, as per mother she was asymptomatic till one year of age then she started having episodes of bleeding per vaginum which were recurrent uh, and had abnormal breast enlargement left side more than right for which she was evaluated by endocrinologist at one and a half years of age uh, she presented to us a month later and was evaluated for the same so uh, there was no history of any foreign body insertion or trauma to genitals there was no history of any headache or seizures there was no history of any medication drug use or any uh, bony abnormalities or skin lesions birth history she was a full term normal vaginal delivery birth weight was was 2 kg and uh, non consanguineous marriage and she had a normal milestones on examination anthropometry her height was 94 cm at the age of 2 years which was plus 1.99 sd weight was 13.5 kg which was plus 160 sd smr was uh, breast stage 3 pubic stage, uh, hair stage 1 and uh, on examination vaginal mucosa was pale and there was no collateral enlargement so dr uh, priyanka before we go ahead with the investigation now if we compare this case with what dhwani had presented our case this case is a much earlier presentation so starting at one year of age i think that's a major difference second major difference is the height advancement so i think that's the other major difference which is there and uh, uh, probably these two will suggest that this is even sooner and likelihood of a pathology will become much more in that regard so but the pattern that you are seeing as you were suggesting that again there is a breast development is marginal it's mainly the the menarche and the bleeding which is there so this looks more likely to be a peripheral precocious puberty as well so let's go on the investigations please then first of all bone age uh, x ray bone age was done so it was advanced uh, at the two age of 2 and a half years the bone age was 4 uh, years then further work up was done uh, the routine investigations uh, were not cbc pt and uh, serum electrolytes were normal ft4 tsh were in the normal range cortisol prolactin were normal but estradiol was high at 82 uh, fsh and lh were lh was suppressed less than 0.1 and testosterone was less than 20 so what we are seeing clearly again is this is like a peripheral precocious puberty but compared to the case we discussed just now the estrogen level is lower uh, is much higher there the estrogen level was had come down so it means there is a persistent estrogen excess the lh of course is undetectable so this again goes in favor of that and fsh is marginal so that is a normal sort of a response yeah please go ahead. the gnrh stimulation test was done uh the basal level of lh was less than 0.03 and uh, which did, did not rise after 1 and 2 hours remained at 1.8 and 1.8 and fsh was 1.23 basal and which rose to 14.18 and 13.7 at 1 and 2 hours mri brain was done to rule out hypothalamic hematoma and uh, whole body bone scan was done which was suggestive of which show, showed no evidence of fibrous dysplasia So USG uh, so showed low left ovarian cyst around three point three by one, uh, and endometrial thickness was increased four to four millimeters. So it was a case of peripheral precocious puberty, uh, and most likely uh, the cause is McCune-Albrecht syndrome, considering the recurrent episodes of vaginal bleeding associated with recurrent ovarian cyst. So now, if you look at this case compared to other case, this is the earlier onset, more severe, recurrent features. Even though you don't have any fibrous dysplasia, even on a bone scan, even if you do not have any skin lesions, we are still much more cautious about the possibility of McCune Albright syndrome, which is there in this scenario. Yeah. Initially, at two and a half years of age, when the child was first evaluated uh, by uh, the other endocrinologist. Uh, aromatase inhibitor letrozole was started at 2.5 mg od but she still she still had episodes of recurrent uh, vaginal bleeding uh, with that treatment so when she presented to us uh, she was started on tamoxifen uh, which is selective estrogen receptor modulator at 10 mg od doses uh, on this treatment her bone age advancement was slowed down and episodes of bleeding were decreased but she, uh, she still on follow up has some uh, times episodes of bleeding on and off For which we have to give progesterone, uh, source of progesterone. 
and uh, she is uh, on follow up. She is regularly followed for bone age and endometrial thickness. And how is her growth pattern? She is, I think, in the normal range for height at the moment. Sir, she is presently ten years old, and she came last uh, at nine years of age, and her uh, bone age was uh, around ten, eleven years. Okay, and so. It is and she hasn't entered into central precocity as well. No, so I sir. think uh, no, this is very, very good that we have been able to control her puberty because at that level of estrogen of 80, if you have continuous or recurrent exposure of that, your bonage has to go up very rapidly. And often by this time or maybe at much younger age, you will have a secondary trigger. And then it becomes very difficult to manage from there. Yeah. So carry on, please. So about Macune Albright syndrome, it is a somatic activating mutation of alpha subunit of G-protein coupled receptor gene S1. It presents with recurrent ovarian cyst and peripheral precocious puberty. It is associated with excess of other gene S hormones presenting with thyrotoxicosis, GH excess, Cushing syndrome, hypophosphatemic rickets, fibrous dysplasia, and multiple cafe alert spots with irregular margins, differentiating it from neurofibromatosis. Uh, management is uh, involved, it involves the inhibition of estrogen production or action. So, uh, aromatase inhibitors like anestrozole or letrozole have been used, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the other drugs are selective estrogen receptor modulators like tamoxifen, uh, which is superior to aromatase inhibitors. And the drug of choice are estrogen receptor antagonists uh, like fulvestrin, but it is very costly. So, uh, that is why. Like uh, it's less, less, less used. Uh, so I think thanks a lot. Uh, uh, this was a very, very interesting case uh, to look at because this really provided us with a lot of uh, insights about when should we suspect Macune Albright and a scenario. So one thing which is always there in our minds is that uh, we think about a possibility that, okay, Macune Albright syndrome basically you have to have all the three things. You need to have a cafe or a spot. You need to have a fibrous dysplasia. You need to have a ovarian cyst. So this is not essential. So effectively, this is a most likely scenario of macunal. Right now, how do we diagnose? How do we confirm? And this is what I will be talking a bit about from that regards, from that perspective. So, Macune Albright, traditionally we have discussed about the various uh, presentation scenarios. There are certain other unusual scenarios which can often happen with Macune Albright as well. This is one of our publications which I published from uh, RCH Melbourne. And this is a very interesting scenario in which we are seeing overlap between Pute's Jagger syndrome and Macune Albright. So, these are these four boys and there were a couple of boys and a couple of girls. All of them had got very peculiar lentigenes like picture. So they were behaving like Pudschega. They were found to have a gastric polyp. And this basically suggests that MAS, the involvement may be very wide. And we need to be cautious about development of other tumors as well. We also identified that there are platelet dysfunctions which may happen in the setting of macunal bed, which we need to be cautious. So the classical phenotype of TSH, GH, RH, or uh, ACTH or MSH is much wider as far as macune albed is concerned. You can have, of course, cafe oil spots, large ovarian cyst, thyromegaly, thyrotoxicosis, along with thyroid nodules, which may develop. You may have a growth hormone excess, which may happen. And you can have multiple areas of involvement, like skeletal dysplasia and fibrous dysplasia, which may happen. So how do you diagnose? And this is the group which has done the maximum work as far as macune albed is concerned, the NIH group. Now, what they are saying is that you need to have two or more clinical features to reach the diagnosis. And the classical features are, of course, fibrous dysplasia is the most common. Cafe olive spots with characteristic features, gonadotropin independent precocious puberty, then testicular thyroid and other scenarios. So this is something which we need to be very, very careful about in that perspective. So they are talking about two or more as a criteria. But that does not mean that if you have a girl with recurrent ovarian cyst who is behaving like, can still have a GNAS activating mutation. Whether you call it macune albright or not, doesn't matter. 
Now, this is what I was discussing about the cafe ole spots. So, Dhwani was describing about those small cafe ole spots. So, what they have mentioned is hyperpigmentation with irregular border, distribution reflecting the midline of the body. So, you it's not the size, it's the pattern which becomes more important from that perspective which was seen in this case. And now, by what diagnosis, the major problem is that this is a somatic mutation. So, you may not be able to identify the scenario. So, what they are saying is that if you take the blood, only 20 to 30 percent may be have a, having a positive diagnosis on the blood. You may have a higher chance, approximately 80 percent, if you take the lesion. So, if you look at the ovarian cyst, the tissue, if you take the skin biopsy from the cafe ole spot, if you take the fibrous dysplasia, you will get a much higher yield. But still, your genetic diagnosis is not going to be 100 percent. So, it cannot exclude. So, what they have said is that if you have a positive result, it confirms McEwen Albert syndrome, but a negative result does not exclude the condition. And therefore, routine role of genetics is not going to be very significant. Your management is not going to change. If you have fibrous dysplasia, you manage it like that. If you have a peripheral precocious puberty, you manage it as a peripheral precocious puberty. If you have thyrotoxicosis, you manage like that. So, it's not that. If you don't find on genetics, you don't need to really think that, okay, we can't do anything. This is not macunal, right? Importantly. Now, this is a very important question. If you have a prepubertal girl coming to you with ovarian cyst and you've excluded hypothyroidism, there are no other features. This looks like isolated. Can it have a genetic etiology? Now, this was an interesting study which was done from the French group. Dr. Sultan was. Uh, uh, the main uh, lead in that. And he had actually done studies about the prenatal ovarian cyst as well. And this was quite a long time ago in this scenario. So what they did was that they tried to evaluate for a number of genes which can potentially cause ovarian cyst. And they studied in these 11 patients. And what they found was that they did not find any of these mutations. An important ones are GNS1, uh, LHCG receptor, of course, and FSH receptor, uh, stars, so all these defects they could not find. So what they're saying is that most of these isolated ovarian cysts are non-genetic in nature. So you don't need to worry too much, especially if you have a single lesion. So don't go ahead and worry about that. Of course, look clinically for a cafe ole, look for the skeletal abnormalities, but you don't need to be too much bothered about reaching a genetic diagnosis in that regard. Now, how do you manage Dr. Priyanka has already mentioned, so specific management would be at the level of either blocking estrogen production, like uh, using a aromatase inhibitor like letrozole, blocking the estrogen action, using a selective estrogen receptor modulator like tamoxifen or falvestrand, which is an antagonist. Then if you have thyrotoxicosis, you use methimazole slash radioactive iodine. GHRH, of course, it's a long acting, it's a hyperplasia. So, you can't do a surgery. So, you have to think of a LAR or a pegvisomand group of drug which will be there. For ACTH, you have to use metarepone or you can use ketoconazole. Rarely, you might have to need an adrenalectomy which is there. And for a fibrous dysplasia, pain, lesion size and other parameters, zolidronic acid is the clear-cut treatment of choice from that regards. Rarely, if there is a secondary central precocity, you can use GnRH analog in that setting. As far as puberty is concerned, as discussed, aromatase inhibitor letrozole has been used, but it tends to increase the ovarian size and it is less efficacious. So, we don't prefer letrozole as a primary therapy and that is why in the case, we shifted from letrozole to tamoxifen. We prefer tamoxifen, but there is a chance of developing ovarian cysts may become bigger. So, you have to monitor that size in that perspective. And of course, the estrogen receptor antagonist, falvestrand, has been shown. I'll show a study also to have a much more potent effect, but you need to give injection. It's a more expensive treatment, and that's why you need to be a bit careful about from that regards. So this study clearly showed that if you use that resolve, you will have improvement as far as the bone age is concerned, as far as the estrogen levels are concerned, but the ovarian volume may actually increase significantly. So the use of uh, letrozole is not favored as a primary agent in McEwen Albert syndrome. Tamoxifen has been shown even to the final adult height that it results in a significant increment of height. And what they are saying, in fact, from 145 to 157. So it's as good as using a GnRH analog. So tamoxifen, and I find this case, we had a very good response. 
she had an onset of one year. So now at 10 years, if we are able to allow the delay in bone age progression, and if we are able to avoid central trigger, it's going to be working very well in that regard. But you have to tell them that this is need to be done on a daily basis. You can't just keep on giving and stopping and then again things will happen. And there will be times when you have some cysts which are formed. You may have high estrogen at that time. You may treat at that time, but continue tamoxifen in that regard. Now, Falvi strand, and this is again a study from Dr. Sultan's group and Erika Ujester's group. And what they have shown clearly is that this is a good drug. The frequency of vaginal bleeding becomes much less. There is improvement in terms of bone age and other parameters as well. So this is a selective estrogen receptor 1, ES1 antagonist, so estrogen receptor alpha antagonist, a effective therapy in that regard. So we now have discussed two interesting young girls, very early onset of ovarian cysts. We now have this younger, slightly older girl with ovarian cysts, Dr. Brabha. Thank you, sir. So we have this uh, six year, five month girl who was born of non consanguineous marriage and her mother bring her because of the concern of early puberty. According to her mother, uh, she noticed the development of breast. So she's few day, uh, one week ago, but there was no pubic hair or axillary growth according to her. And uh, the, she started to bleed within the three days of breast development, but it was non-cyclical. It was just uh, one episode. After the bleed, she observed that there was a reduction in the size of the breast. And she also told us that there was no sudden increment on the height and there was no any virilization. She told us that there was no history of any accidental intake of any medicine. There was no history of any abdominal distension or pain. And she never had any constipation or cold intolerance or dry skin. She don't have any bony deformities or hyperpigmented patches. So this is a much, so how is this case different from the two cases? That we two cases, uh, Dhwani's case presented at the age of like two years, three years, and Dr. Priyanka's presented at very early, like one year of age, and she presented at a, a later in the early childhood at six years of age. So there is a later presentation of this. So, so this is very, very important that you have a much later, later presentation. presentation. The chances of any congenital disorder congenital. becomes less likely because it's unusual. It won't happen with Michael Albert not presented at six years. Six That's years of age. Very important. Right. Now, you gave a very important history that the breast size decrease decreases. Decreases after. The, what does it mean? It means that uh, uh, something has happened. The estrogen has increased. And once the bleeding has occurred, the estrogen level has decreased and that's, that has led to the decrease in the estrogen level and that is... The other thing, your estrogen level decreased, so the breast decreased decrease. and at that time, then you have the bleeding. Ah, withdrawal. Right, this right. is what has happened. So hmm. probably now when the child has come to you, the cyst is not producing... Producing any estrogen. estrogen right. So which condition does this rule out? Uh, this uh, has ruled out like uh, any cyclical cause, any persistent uh, or... Uh, it has ruled out a tumor. Tumor. If it was an autonomous tumor, you won't have this sort of phenomenon. The issue will continue to grow. Now, when you have an ovarian cyst, basically, what is the ovarian cyst? Ovar structure. structure. Mean by ovarian, ovarian cyst is, is uh, like... Uh, is... Uh, uh, is a follicle fill. It is a filled with a fluid, a clear fluid. Yeah, is a follicle, follicle filled with fluid. Surrounded by a granulosa cell, cell and thicker. Now, as the cyst becomes bigger, uh, there will be a time when you won't be getting enough supply of nutrients, vascular, tay, and whatever, your hormonal and whatever. And then, once it outgrows its side, it's going to shrink off and the hormone level will fall down. Right. But if it's an autonomic tumor like a granulosa, granulosa cell, cell. Yes. so this fact of this coming down is a positive sign in that regard. Yes. Uh, okay, carry on. As uh, there was no history of any previous treatment, uh, there was no history of uh, she was a uh, AGA and uh, an examination, her vitals were completely normal. 
and uh, her journal examination there was uh, no coarse facies no goiter and no bony deformities or cafe oily spots and no abdominal distension or any tenderness on the anthropometry uh, she was short uh, her height sds was minus 2.9 sds uh, below minus uh, 2.9 sds and even the weight was compromised it was less than minus 3.3 standard sds it was clearly showing that she has a growth failure of a nutritional pattern and uh, uh, her smr staging was b2 uh, pubic hair stage 1 and uh, she had a bleeding so definitely again, as compared to bunny's case this is again b2 b2 so yes sir start, ah. but dr priyanka's case had a more b3 yeah. exposure that's right okay yes sir. b3 and that was the only girl who had growth acceleration. Yes, sir. Because there were recurrent episodes of insulin excess. Mm -hmm. In this case, in fact, she is short. Short. So you should think of hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism, of yes, sir. And in your case, the height was normal. 15. So, it was normal. so again, which means it was a recent insulin exposure. Yes. So if uh, I uh, put my differentials on, so with a short stature and the early puberty, so the first differential will be the hypothyroidism first. But if I keep the early puberty, so exogenous intake of the estrogen, if the girl has accidentally intake the mother's estrogen pill, that it could be one of the possibility. Functional ovarian cyst, it could be the possible, it could be the main, most likely possibility. And mechanical bright system as the, it is, it is not possible, uh, it is the rare possibility to onset at this letter presentation. So it is the rare possibility. Mm -hmm too late and as she has a one onset of the bleed so tumors is less likely to happen because she has just one onset of bleed so and if uh, on the investigation what we found that the uh, blood proof uh, this uh, thyroid profile was absolutely normal both the LH and FSH was uh, prepubertal and the estrogen was uh, 42 which was uh, high for this age so clearly so showing that this is a uh, going in the favor of uh, um, this uh, peripheral precocious puberty and when we did the bone age it was a uh, 5.5 age which is delayed not, not delayed just uh, appropriate for the age and when we did the pelvic ultrasound what we found the endometrium thickness was 2.9 mm and we found a single cyst in the right ovary, which was two centimeter into three centimeter. And both the ovaries were absolutely normal in shape and in ecogenicity and with no adenexal mass. So if I summarize my case, uh, we had a female with the rapid breast development and subsequent vaginal bleeding with no pubic and axillary hair growth at the age of 6.5 years. And the bleeding leads to a reduction of breast size, and it was not associated with any cyclical episodes. There was no evidence of exogenous exposure and acute abdominal pain, distension, or bony deformities. And in the light of low gonadotropins and high estrogen normal thyroid profile, the most likely diagnosis in this case would be the functional ovarian cyst. So, management the most, uh, the, we manage this child conservatively. And on the follow-up, she visited a few days back. She had attained the normal pubertal development and Minaki at the 11 years of age. So there was no repeat. No repeat. Yeah. So this is the most common manifestation of isolated function. About how do you manage the ovarian system? Uh, so should I proceed? No. So, if uh, we go by the definition, uh, as Dhani has already uh, gone through this, what the uh, this ovary, ovarian cyst is. So, generally, the physiological ovarian cyst is common in childhood and it does not exceed more than 10 mm. But uh, by the definition, ovarian cyst is, it is a fluid-filled image and it is generally more than 20 mm. And it is purely anechogenic and it is filled with clear fluid, has a regular wall. And it goes in the fa uh, favor of functional ovarian cyst. And um, it has already been discussed. It has an incidence of less than 5% with a, in the age of birth to 8 years. And the functional ovarian cyst includes the follicular ovarian cyst. And it could also be the corpus luteum. And the causes of the central precocious puberty, McKinnon-Albright syndrome, overt hypothyroidism, aromatase, 
access it is and uh, non classical can, can, can also cause but pur can also cause that's why if you look at that they have done pur in those settings. yes sir and proteus syndrome can also cause uh, this uh, functional ovarian cyst and presentation up, uh, abdominal pain rapid breast development vaginal bleeding and the specifically cephal spots and fibril dysplasia could be the presentation and the lab investigation as we know the thyroid profile gonadotropin cystoidal levels skeletal survey and the bone age should be done and the uterus and the ultrasound of the uterus is the most important and the best investigation to look for the ovarian cyst and if we found any ecogenicity and uh, irregular uh, walls in the cyst we should go for the tumor markers like afp beta acg and the ca99 which are the and the it, the studies had shown that they had done 1818 ultrasound studies uh, of the prepubertal girls and they found that only 99 patients presented with ovarian cyst and only 82 of these patients have cysts that was less than 10 mm and only 17 had cysts that were greater than 20 mm and only five of the these 17 patients presented with pubertal development so by this yes, data non-function non and you may not even pick up pick that's up, what right. i'm saying so you don't get too worried if you see over right. so if we go by the management generally if the cyst is anechogenic in the ultrasound we can manage it conservatively and we observe it generally the size of the cyst decreases in two to three weeks we monitor it monthly by the usg until it resolve completely and uh, the surgery is indicated when the symptoms when there is significant symptoms when there is a concern for malignancy if there is a solid like uh, uh, if there is a ecogenicity in the seats if there is a multilocular margins if there is increased blood flow in the doppler if there is increased afp there is a torsion or if there is a failure to resolve failure of the cyst to resolve on the serial ultrasound so so these are it's more than 10 centimeters, you have to be really bothered not about it. If it's between 5 to 10 centimeters, generally follow up. And if it's not resolving by 6 months, you then refer on that. So less than 5 centimeters, nothing to worry. 5 to 10 follow up and not decreasing center of gynecologist, more than 10 immediate referral. Of course, if you have solid cystic area, you have to worry about right so away. 10 centimeter is a, uh, valid for each and every age group? More or less, more or less, because they will be much bigger for that. So this is how we will managing in terms of that. We'll stay, uh, we'll now carry forward to our last case, which is an interesting case of ovarian cyst with short stature. I welcome Dr. Alapan to present this. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my case is a ovarian cyst with a uh, girl presented with short stature. So, a seven year girl has initially presented to a GP with an off and on headache, uh, which was uh, initially he did a MRI and he saw a mass like lesion in the pituitary region, for which he referred the child to the neurosurgeon. And the neurosurgeon, in the view of a ovarian function, uh, a cyst in the ovary, he referred the child to us. So, Initially, the girl had off and on headache associated with a menarche, which was started uh, three months back. Also, the girl developed this uh, development three months ago, uh, and the menarche was uh, one month ago. You have a girl who has got a filtry mass, and she has developed menarche. So, yes. diagnosis is there. This is clearly case of central precaution. Uh, so, we have to go further to uh, evaluate this case. So whether this would be the usual pubertal manifestation of a Pituitary uh, adenoma. What happens to puberty in pituitary adenoma? Suppose, assuming this was a pituitary adenoma, what is your pattern? Suppose this was a gonadotropin producing adenoma, will it cause precocious puberty? Uh, no, sir, this will not uh, Why? cause. Uh, because. Uh, uh, Suppose it is producing LHF effect, so why will it not cause puberty? So that's why the key principle is if you see pituitary adenoma in a girl with precocious puberty, it is not the cause, it's an incidental reason. So even though the neurosurgeon is thinking there's a pituitary mass which is producing gonadotropins, causing ovarian cysts, causing precocious puberty, that's not the case, and we'll see what the cause subsequently from that other angle. 
Yeah. Uh, the and again, this discordance is very, very evident in this case. Now, the child had a very uh, short height, but the weight was on the normal side, clearly showing that this is a case of an endocrinal type of a short stature. The breast was uh, well developed in stage four. There is no pubic hair development and menarche has already been started. So there was two things in our hand. That is, one is the short stature and the girl has presented with a precocious puberty, which has a discordant one. Now, this is the picture of this girl, which uh, clearly shows a breast stage of four. No pubic hair. No pubic is present. Uh, investigation. So what are you thinking now? You're linking up ovarian cyst, short stature, precocious puberty, and a puberty mass. So this has a uh, thing that uh, this is a case of peripheral precocious puberty, first of all, because there is a discordance in the uh, uh, presentation of breast development and menarche and associated with the st uh, short stature. So uh, differential like uh, hypothyroidism will be there in our uh, possibility, there will be one possibility. Macune albright can also present, but uh, the age is very... Uh, you have to link with the mass. How do you link mass with hypothyroidism? Uh, hypothyroidism uh, can also be cause a pituitary hypoplasia like uh, picture because of this uh, low level of uh, thyro um, thyroxine there will be increase in the uh, thyrotrop releasing hormone which acts on the pituitary lactotrop and somatotrops causing this pituitary hyperplasia like picture so, so that is very very important and macune albright for you can't think of suddenly somebody comes to you at seven years of age with short height clearly this will be a case of hypothyroidism now, macune albright can it cause a pituitary mass? It can cause a somatotrop hyperplasia, but usually yes, it will not be that big. Thyrotrop hyperplasia is very big, but somatotrop hyperplasia, you will have so many features of acromegaly or growth hormone excess by that time. So, that is a theoretical thing, but this is classically, I think this is a, a scenario you can blindly say this is. Hypothyroidism, a large mass, and every year we see would be cases like this who are referred to neurosurgeons, referred to gynecologists. So, large mass, ovarian mass, pituitary mass, and short stature, precautions people take. This is hypothyroidism, which you will see on the workup as well. I think we worked up on the basis of the short stature, and the routine workup was absolutely normal except from the thyroid profile, which shows a PSH level of more than 100. And also we have started then with the uh, basis of the TS, high TSH level, we started the patient on the thyroxine 75 microgram. So if we uh, gather together all these things in the table, uh, that there is precocious puberty, which is a peripheral one, there is a hypothyroidism, and also there is a pituitary hyperplasia like picture. So this clearly indicates a diagnosis towards the Van Wee Grumbach syndrome. Now, regarding the history, this uh, thing was initially diagnosed in 1905 uh, by Dr. Uh, F. W. Kendall, who diagnosed this in a nine-year-old girl, uh, girl child who has a uh, prominent features of severe hypothyroidism. But to surprise Dr. Kendall, there was also precocious puberty instead of a delayed puberty, which he has reported in his uh, case report. And uh, in fact, uh, there are reports even from 1800s, 1850, 70, which talk about that. So, when the original word was coined, mm -hmm. they mentioned it is 100 year old at that time. But unfortunately, still we are seeing cases which is extremely uh, unfortunate. Yes. And then, even then, they are missed. So, this is something which is known to the medical literature for such a long time. And the term was actually coined in 1960, so, so late paper, in the They talked about 100 years from then. Okay. So, it is like such a old Good. scenario. And now, they used to give thyroid uh, thyroxine extract from the sips uh, yeah, they had yeah. used in that uh, patient. Grams and other quantities. Now, regarding the pathogenesis, as Sarah has already described, that this glycoprotein hormones like TSH, LH, and FSH and HCG had a similar alpha subunit and a difference in the beta subunit. This similar alpha subunit causing this high TSH to act on the FSH receptor to form this uh, ovarian cyst like picture. There is Due to this ovarian cyst, there is increased estrogen production, and this estrogen production is causing this thalarchy and menarche. As there was puberty is stimulated by another axis, the ACTH axis, there is no usual puberty present in this case. Now, why is this case is different from another uh, other cases? Because uh, the usually we see that uh, in 
uh, hypothyroidism, the pu puberty is usually delayed. But in our case, the puberty is usually precocious due to the FSH receptor action on the uh, TSH. There is, in the precocious puberty, the bone age is usually advanced, but in this case, the bone age is usually delayed. And in precocious puberty, we also know that the, there is presence of sparse hair presentation, but there are many case reports which have seen there is hypertrichosis that is associated with this case. Now a case report which showing a male child uh, who presented with uh, this uh, peripheral precocious like picture, the large testicular volume with uh, large testicular volume, but there was hypertrichosis that is uh, seen in this uh, picture are uh, present in the back and the facial region. And they have uh, case having a case report like that. So we have discussed four very, very interesting cases, two of very early onset ovarian cyst, one which turned out to be Macune Albright like and second, which was functional. A second one, which was uh, basically in the form of hypothyroidism and another scenario in which you have a functional cyst. So how do we manage peripheral precautious puberty? We already discussed, if you're thinking of a macunal bright, use aromatase inhibitors, use selective estrogen receptor modulators, estrogen receptor antagonist. Hypothyroidism, if you treat with thyroid replacement, the cyst will regress, they will improve. You may have to give a course of progesterone because they may have uncontrolled bleeding. Once you treat hypothyroidism, their estrogen levels will fall and their bleeding may become very severe at that point of time. High dose of progesterone may be required. And usually for ovarian cysts, unless it's larger than 10 centimeters, unless you have got other markers of malignancies, tumor markers, solid areas, you don't need to worry about and just observe in that regard. So we'll uh, now close and you can all who are going to have a look at our website and the courses app and books in that regard. We'll quickly look at if there are any particular questions which are there. So I think there are a few. Uh, so does genetic test confirm MAS in this case? We did not go for the genetic test because there was no cutaneous tissue and the ovarian cyst would have been difficult to extract fluid from there. Peripheral blood, 20 to 30% only cases are there. So if you have many manifestations, you are more likely to pick up on the peripheral blood. Dr. Choman is asking, in some cases of untreated, undiagnosed peripheral precocious puberty, it may trigger central system as well. How can we diagnose the primary pathology and how can we treat? This is a very, very interesting question. This is much more common in boys as against girls. And girls, of course, the history is so obvious, you will not miss it. So if a girl has bleeding at one or two years, they will immediately come to you. But often with CAH, non, uh, the simple virilizing form, the presentation is so gradual that they will not come to you at that time. So it's much more common in boys. But if you have a doubt, if there's again a discordant history, which is that will give you like a peripheral. And then if it's triggered, of course, still you will have some evidence of a primary pathology. It most often happens with macune albright. Of course, functional ovarian cysts in hypothyroidism will not trigger because in those scenarios, the bone age is not advanced. So this was uh, overall a very interactive session. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Dhwani, Dr. Uh, Alapan and Dr. Vibha and Dr. Priyanka as well for presenting these cases. And we'll be having more such